All right, so we're going to talk about the Spanish-American War. And the Spanish-American War uh, is used as an example of this uh, U.S. foreign policy um, that was considered kind of a new paradigm um, by some historians or by other historians as just uh, pure imperialism. All right. And so the Spanish-American War occurred in 1898 and, of course, was between the United States and Spain. And just on the surface, it was uh, fought to help the Cubans gain their independence. And that's how it was kind of, uh, I guess, uh, pushed um, in order to get American support. Uh, but there were other reasons that the war was fought uh, as well. Now, throughout, let me just give you a little background. Uh, and I'm not going to, well, I don't want to say I'm not going to test you because sometimes I do throw a little question there or whatever about some things that sometimes I say I'm not going to do but end up doing anyway so everything's fair game but uh, throughout the late 19th century the Cubans repeatedly vote, uh, revolted against uh, the Spanish and Americans had a huge investment in uh, Cuban sugar they had a lot of sh sugar plantations and, and uh, things like that about 50 million dollars worth and uh, the United States traded more with uh, Cuba than with Spain. And so many, you could say, you know, Americans, many American business uh, people, uh, interest groups felt that it would, you know, it would behoove, uh, it would economically benefit the United States if uh, Cuba were free. Uh, we say were there because it's conditional. It's like if Cuba, if Cuba were free then blah 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 so what for whatever reasons um, you know somebody decided one day that we're gonna use for this we're gonna use the plural okay um, you could say Cuba was free and then it wasn't free but if you say if Cuba were free blah 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 in this case if Cuba were free it would benefit um, some American business interests uh, anyway um, the <clears throat> um, there was a, a lot of, um, of poverty uh, in Cuba uh, among many of the Cubans, and of course that made them more restive, you know, more um, inclined to revolt and that kind of thing. And led by the Cuban Revolutionary Party, which is headquartered in New York, uh, the rebels purposely attacked railways and plantations in an effort to force American investors to call for intervention by the United States. And so it's just kind of... Um, you know, it's kind of funny because they were really just trying to kind of get things going. And most Americans sympathized with the rebels because Americans kind of like this idea of like, yes, you know, you need to fight for your independence from a colonial power. You know, just like the United States had won their you know, revolutionary war. In 1896, um, while attempting to crush the rebellion, there was a Spanish uh, general. His name was Valeriano Whaler. Oops, let me get right here. Whaler. I always want to put an A right there, but it's an E. Spanish general. And he put a lot of the civilians in barbed wire concentration camps. where disease from poor sanitation killed a lot of uh, people. And the American public was outraged and Congress called for action, but President Grover Cleveland at the time refused to intervene. So this was before William McKinley uh, became president. Remember we talked about him. He became president in 1896. 
Uh, he offered to cooperate with the Spanish government to bring about peace on the basis of home rule when Cuba would get like a little bit of um, uh, autonomy. Uh, Cleveland even used the Navy to break up the rebels' gun running operation. Now, <clears throat> there were two major um, media tycoons, uh, you might say, a guy by the name of William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. And they both knew that war, all right, was good, oh, is good business. In other words, uh, if you want to sell um, uh, newspapers, then uh, war is always good uh, for that. And so uh, Hearst sent a guy by the name of Remington, Frederick Remington, Right. Uh, to draw some of the atrocities that he saw. And when he got there, Hearst, uh, you know, he, he sent Hearst uh, and basically said, uh, you know, things are not really that bad. And so some people say, and I doubt Hearst actually said that, and said this exactly, but it kind of gives you the idea of um, what was going on. He said, basically, you furnish the pictures, I don't know why I'm writing all this. And I'll furnish the war. Now I don't know if he said that. I doubt if he actually said those words. But this is the, but this gives you an idea of what is known of what we call the yellow press. And it's pretty much still the case today. All right. So what was the yellow press? At that time, you had a lot of newspapers that would exaggerate stories, that would sensationalize stories in order to sell newspapers. And it's the same thing as what we see in the media today. Okay, you know, we think, we always hear about how the country is so divided, and maybe to some extent it is, uh, but in the media, you have people um, that they will get to talk about issues that are not necessarily experts on those issues, but just represent an ex you know a more extreme uh, view, and then and then you'll get the same thing on this side, and then they they argue back and forth. All right. You're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. You're you are a dummy head. Okay, um, and they go back and forth, and you never learn anything because they don't have it. You know, they don't have experts sitting there talking about the nuances of issues. Okay, and you know why? Because look, it's boring. Okay, now I do. I admit I do watch uh, C-SPAN. Okay, I love C-SPAN, okay, but I'm kind of a weirdo, all right? So, you know, most people are not going to sit there and watch, you know, like I sit there and watch a um, Congress debate, okay, because I am, you know, maybe a little weird. Okay, I can't help it, all right? But most people, all right, and, and I'm the same way, don't get me wrong, I'm not above this. You flipping through the channels, you know, we have about a thousand channels nowadays, not like when I was younger, you know, we had three channels, and then when my parents were, were kids, they didn't even have television, you know. Uh, so today when you're flipping through the, the channels, you're, you're going to tend to stop where you see people arguing. So you might say that, you know, a lot of media today is just maybe a little bit above Jerry Springer. So, uh, you know, things haven't changed that much. I mean, in the late 1800s, it was the same way, all right? And newspapers would, especially people like, uh, Pulitzer and Hearst, I mean, they would exaggerate uh, these um, uh, 
they would exaggerate a lot of these uh, stories to sell newspapers. Okay, and so you definitely need to kind of, you know, I want you to read about in the book and on the internet, read a little bit more about Pulitzer and Hearst and uh, the Yellow Press. Well, anyway, basically Hearst published a, a lot of, you know, pictures um, that really were, you know, things that were not even, that didn't really even happen, but that still outraged Americans. I mean, Americans, you know, we're kind of a, a weird lot um, in the sense that, you know, I think Americans are very um, compassionate in many ways. I think that when we see injustices in the world that we want to do uh, what's right, uh, at the same time, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we can be very callous. I mean, we if we are go, if we go to war and we happen to kill some kids, you know, just that's just we just say, well, that's just war, you know, and we don't really think about it too much. So, you know, and I mean, I think we all have a little bit of both of that, um, both of those feelings in us. You know, I, I don't know what what's up with that. And I, like I said, I wish we were in a face to face class. We could discuss that a little bit more. Um, so anyway, and, and again, listen, anytime. Y'all have questions, you know, uh, anytime you, you disagree with something I say or whatever, look, feel free uh, to please let me know and, and we could discuss it, you know, and we can uh, talk about it, you know, over email or, or whatever, uh, because I don't want you to think that I have, you know, some kind of monopoly on, on truth here. Well, in 1896, William McKinley... Um, became president. Okay, this, let me see, this doesn't look right. Yeah, okay, hold on. McKin, no, there we go. That's right. I'm sorry. Uh, William McKinley became president. And so, um, now McKinley had been shot at before. You understand what I'm saying? In, in the, many of the people, um, a lot of people had, that the, 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 the Civil War generation had died for the most part. But there were still some people that were alive, like McKinley, who had fought in the U.S. Civil War. And when you've been shot at before and when you've been in war, you tend to not want to go to war. A lot of times um, I, in my classes, I have veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I'm actually a veteran of the first Gulf War, but I didn't really do anything. I just stayed lost the whole time. Um, but anyway, you know, but people that have really been in combat, um, oftentimes, you know, say, look, you know, it, uh, we should be very careful when we go to war, all right, because they know how horrible it is. And McKinley was the same way. Uh, but still, people kind of were, were pushing him to help the Cubans out. In 1898, um, the USS Maine exploded in uh, Havana Harbor. And people, about 260 Americans... Uh, were killed, uh, maybe uh, more than that. I'm not sure the exact number. Maybe y'all can y'all can look that up for me. I can I could probably find that fairly quickly. But I'm, it's about that uh, around that number. And of course, Americans don't like when America other Americans get killed. You know, it didn't didn't bother them. I guess during the Civil War because they were killing each other. So I guess Americans kind of feel like you know nobody can kill Americans unless they're an American. But anyway, and uh, many people were like, look, we have to go to war. Uh, people were saying, remember the Maine, to hell with Spain. All right, remember the Maine, to hell with Spain. And so the United States went to war, and, and just in about four months, we defeated um, the Spanish. Now, what did we get out of this? All right, well, Cuba got their, uh, their independence, uh, we were able to get some, um, like, for example, um, uh, Puerto Rico uh, became a territory. Uh, and we were able to get um, islands uh, in the Pacific because Spain uh, controlled the Philippines. And so we were able to go in there, um, really pretty much kick the Spanish out of the Philippines. We acquired other uh, areas like Guam. All right, so this is kind of, again you know, sort of moving toward what Mahan was wanting to do, all right? Um, so, again, uh, the United States acquired 
uh, Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, the Philippines. Cuba received um, her independence. Um, and there were some people that um, were kind of anti-imperialist, people like Mark Twain and Andrew Carnegie. These guys, you know, argued that it was immoral to imitate Spain uh, and these European powers, all right, by holding the Philippines in bondage, for example. Was, you know, we, did, we let Cuba go, um, but we, we still controlled, we decided to control the Philippines. And again, this was, you know, some historians argue that this was really about Asian markets. Asian markets. Now, from 1899 to 1902, uh, the Filipinos re re rebelled, understandably, against the United States. Um, and there was a lot of massacres and torture uh, on both sides. Uh, in 1901, Congress declared the Philippines an unorganized territory and opposed a governor on the island, which happened to be William Howard Taft, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, was the first? He was the first governor. And by 1916, although an American governor remained, the Filipinos were allowed to elect a legislature, and full independence did not come until 1946. Okay, so Cuba controlled the Philippines up to 1898. I mean, wait, this goes back to the 1500s. And then the United States controlled the Philippines until, you know, 1946. So, you know, many people said that, hey, look, you know, what we're doing is we're just becoming, um, you know, imperialistic like Great Britain was, like France was. I mean, that's why when you go to West Africa, people speak French, um, that just like uh, the Spanish were. Uh, the Filipino language is kind of a mix between the indigenous languages and Spanish. Now, the United States withdrew from Cuba in 1902 after first compelling the Cubans to write what was called the Platt Amendment into their constitution, which allowed uh, the United States to militarily intervene whenever necessary to ensure Cuban independence and, quote, a government adequate for the protection of life, property, and individual liberty. And it gave the United States a naval base at Guantanamo Bay. And under the Platt Amendment, Roosevelt sent an ex expeditionary force to Cuba to help, to help keep an unpopular government in power from 1906 to 1909. At that time, Walter Reed, an army doctor stationed in Cuba, Cuba uh, deduced that yellow fever was carried by a certain breed of mosquito. Now, it wasn't just Reed. Uh, but uh, many of his assistants as well, but he's the one that gets uh, most of the credit. The, the, the discovery eventually extended the lives of millions of inhabitants of, um, of the world's tropical regions and also in, uh, in New Orleans because they had a lot of problems uh, in New Orleans. And they actually tested some of these ideas. They went around when there's a, uh, right, you know, um, when there looked like there was going to be a yellow fever epidemic or it could have really been bad. In the early 1900s, they went around and, uh, um, you know, basically um, the, uh, you know, just I'm trying to think of the, you know, spread like an insecticide around New Orleans, you know, to kill the mosquitoes and, and that kind of helped curb uh, the epidemic there. I lost my, my train of thought there for a second. Uh, anyway, of course, Walter Reed Hospital was named after uh, Walter Reed. Uh, in 1917, the, um, uh, uh, Puerto Rico was granted full U.S. citizenship. Uh, so, you know, this was all part of, again, uh, the Spanish-American War. Uh, but, um, you know, I kind of used this to talk about other things like the Yellow Press and today's media and the debate between, you know, among some historians about what was, you know, is the United States an empire or, you know, was it an empire at that time? Uh, there were other things that obviously the United States got involved with. Uh, we acquired the Panama Canal in 1903. Uh, we um, uh, also uh, got involved in the Pacific in order to uh, acquire and eventually grant statehood to Hawaii. All of these things that many people kind of felt was a little bit unseemly and even to some extent almost un-American because it was really kind of against some of these values uh, that some, you know, 
people argue, some people argue, was has always been part of America. Okay, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. I usually spend more time on this period of history, uh, but for my online class, I'm not. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on uh, the causes of uh, World War One, though, and we'll also kind of get into some uh, some other things, uh, of course, uh, later as well. Okay, uh, so that ends this lecture.